folks, we'll be getting started momentarily. Thanks for joining us. Hey, hey, somebody change Pam's phone number. If you're in control, change Pam, Pam's phone number to her name. So her phone number don't appear on there. Good point, thank you. Good deal. Hey folks, my name is Marinda. My pronouns are they, them. I wanna welcome you to tonight's webinar, Free Mumia, Free Them All, brought to you by the newly reformed Prisoners Solidarity Committee of Workers World Party. We say free them all because the United States empire feeds off the mass criminalization of people within the fatal invention of its borders. Some Spanish encomiendas, which rewarded colonizers with the stolen labor and land of indigenous people living what is now the Southern United States. The plantations were enslaved Africans toiled over the land. This empire was built and has expanded off human captivity. The era of mass incarceration or mass criminalization has simply shifted the means of captivity to jails, prisons, detention centers, and juvenile facilities. As Mark Lamont Hill has said, we continue to take all of our contradictions as a nation and put them behind bars. Whether it's mental illness, whether it's poverty, whether it's homelessness, whether it's drug addiction, and of course, political dissent. Anyone who dares speak out against empire ends up in a cage. That's why we have Mumia Abu Jamal in a cage. So again, we say free Mumia, free them all. Part of the revolutionary struggle lies in the relationships that we build with other workers and oppressed people involved in the fight against racist, sexist, ableist, colonial capitalist oppression. Prisoner Solidarity Committee of Workers World Party exists in order to break down barriers between members of our class that the state purposefully has tried to isolate. Solidarity is stronger than the walls meant to isolate us from one another. Since the initial launch of the PSC 50 years ago in 1970, the prison industrial complex has expanded and mutated and been exported abroad. This global pandemic has only exacerbated these conditions and presented caged people with possible death sentences. Ruth Wilson Gilmore describes, describes the structure of racism as vulnerability to premature death, which we see so starkly in this period. Those with access to centuries of stolen resources are generally able to skirt spaces where they might encounter the virus and generally avoid other life shortening mechanisms like cages or lack of medical care. The people that have been placed into cages intimately understand jail and prison walls can't contain the spread of the virus. What is on the outside will be on the inside and what happens to our communities on the inside will affect us all. At a time when there are more people unemployed, undocumented, incarcerated or criminalized and there are people working in the US labor force we understand that mass criminalization is a threat to us all. All the different sectors of our collective class are bound to one another. Our liberation lives on in our ability to use all levers and all tactics to work across and with, with the things that make us different. Our liberation is bound to unemployed people, undocumented workers, incarcerated workers, and to each other. And tonight, I'm co-chairing with Monica Moorhead, pronoun she, her, managing editor of Workers World Newspaper and editor of Marxism, Reparations in the Black Freedom Struggle. Thank you, Miranda, and good evening, everyone. It was the work of the Prisoner Solidarity Committee of Youth Against War and Fascism back in the 1970s that won me to Workers' Well Party regarding the role that prisons play 
as part of the repressive role of the capitalist state. However, prisons incarcerate not only workers, one of the most oppressed sectors of our class, but they incarcerate political prisoners or prisoners of war. What do I mean by prisoners of war? When we raise the cases of Mamiya Abu Jamal, Leonard Peltier, Imam Jamil Abdullah Alamin, Dr. Matulu Shakur, Jalil Montakem, The Move Nine, Rochelle McGee, and Asada Shakur before she found refuge in Cuba, we're talking about leaders of movements for national liberation for their oppressed nations fighting a just war against repressive imperialist white supremacy, which is now facing a new chapter of rebellion today. These movements included the Black Panther Party, American Indian Movement, the Young Lords, Black Liberation Army, and more. These prisoners of war were brutally targeted for genocide by the FBI's COINTELPRO with the assistance of local and state police agencies, which you will hear more about tonight. But despite spending decades in prison, resulting in ill health and even facing a slow death, these heroic prisoners never surrendered their revolutionary principles to this day. In closing, I was honored to be part of a delegation which included Comrade Pam Africa that traveled to socialist Cuba 20 years ago last month to meet with Comandante Fidel Castro, who asked to be briefed on the cases of Mamiya and Shaka Sankofa, who was martyred 20 years ago on June 22nd. We also participated in a televised roundtable discussion in Havana on the US prison industrial complex. It was another exemplary example of Cuba's unwavering revolutionary solidarity with oppressed peoples around the world, including inside the US, just 90 miles away from their shores. Free Mamiya and free them all, tear down the prison walls. Thank you. Thanks, Monica. This webinar is organized by revolutionary activists and members of Workers' World Party, which is a national Marxist-Leninist organization fighting for socialism. If you like what you hear tonight and want to check us out, go to www.workers.org and click on Join WWP to sign up. You can also read the latest articles from our paper and check out the latest PDF of the paper. After we hear from all the speakers tonight, we'll have a question and answer session. If you have any questions, please write them directly into the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. I would now like to introduce Larry Holmes, Workers World Party's first secretary and theoretical contributor to Workers World. 20 years ago, Larry, Monica Moorhead and other party members disrupted a speech by then Texas governor and presidential candidate George W. Bush at an NAACP convention in Baltimore following the heinous execution of Shaka Sankofa, also known as Gary Graham. This is Larry being carried out by security. Larry, can you speak on the political connection between the frame up and conviction of Mumia to the role of fraternal order of police in Philadelphia? Okay, I'm trying to make sure you've got my, um, can you hear me? I can hear you. I'm trying to make sure you got, you can see me? I don't think I can see you yet. All right, I'm trying to fix that. Okay. There we go. Can no, you see me now? Yes. Okay, great, great. Um, uh, good evening, uh, comrades and friends. Um, I, I'll, uh, I'll answer Comrade Marinda's question, but I want to I want to start by putting it in a historical context, based on this tremendous uprising against police terror that we have been witnessing, and if we're fortunate enough participating in uh, over more than a, a month now after the lynching of uh, George Floyd, um, I'm feeling very good about 
these Confederate statues coming down all over the country, even statues of police tyrants like Rizzo in, 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 in Philadelphia. Uh, uh, to a certain extent, this is symbolic uh, as to be distinguished from some substantial concession or ending of police terror. I think everybody realizes that we're a long way from that. Don't get the symbolic uh, confused with the uh, substantial, but nonetheless, they're important victories and, and, and they have historic meaning. Uh, in a way, it is uh, the masses primarily led by young people forcing the uh, ruling class to come to terms with its history and its presence, uh, present practice of white supremacy. Uh, but uh, when we talk about Mumia and other political prisoners, uh, we must insist that uh, their reality, suffering and languishing in prison be reckoned with too because they are casualties of the Black liberation movement. The police declared war on the Black liberation movement, and there were many, many casualties. 50 years ago, uh, instead of the Black Lives Matter movement, you would be talking about the Black Panther Party. And the Black Panther Party begin by fighting against police terror in Oakland and in California. That, that, those were the roots of their uh, beginning, just like the Black uh, Lives Matter movement. Uh, they became such a threat for many reasons. Maybe we'll get a chance to go into that later. They became revolutionaries, essentially that the, uh, the FBI and COINTELPRO and the police uh, systematically uh, destroyed them, uh, either assassinating uh, their leaders like uh, Fred Hampton in various ways, setting them against each other, forcing many of them to go into exile like Huey Newton, or framing many up and putting them in jail which was uh, the situation with Mumia Abu-Jamal. Uh, now, Mumia, who I believe everyone knows, uh, if, if, if you don't, you know, just ask and, and, and we'll bring you up to stuff on that, uh, is still, I believe, uh, that not, on, uh, not only uh, one political prisoner representing the Black liberation movement in this country, but perhaps the most renowned Black political prisoner of the Black liberation movement, languishing in jail for a time on death row and more recently in the general population for almost, almost 40 years. And, and comrades, uh, we must be clear about this. The only reason why Mumia is still in jail the only reason why they kept the move nine in so long is because the fraternal order of police, not just in Philadelphia, but nationwide, demanded that these prisoners of the war against the black liberation movement stay in jail and die in jail because that's what the police wanted uh, that's the price that they wanted. That's the pound of flesh that they wanted in their war against the black movement. And uh, organizations like the Fraternal uh, Order of Police have tremendous political power. They can dictate to the judicial system and the political system in a place like Philadelphia and tell judges, don't you dare give Mumia a new trial. Don't you dare you know, try to redress the, the, the many, many injustices in his trial. We want him to die in jail, you know, because it's a war. See? 
And we've got to recognize that. And we've got to say that our struggle to deal with police terror, which is what's on everybody's mind, cannot be dealt with until we deal with Mumia's situation and the other political prisoners. We've got to say, if the, if the police have really been pushed back, if we've really uh, hit their political power, their dictatorial power over political and judicial systems in this country, then Mumia has to walk free. That prison gate has to open and Mumia has to walk free. Then you start reckoning and healing the wounds of the Black liberation struggle that didn't just begin a few months ago or a few years ago, but began many, many, many years ago. Uh, now, there are other political prisoners. Comrade Monica may talk about them. Rochelle McGee, he's still in prison. He must be 80. Sundiata Coley, uh, and many more. I, I don't want to forget any. And, and, and these prisoners are not getting any younger. And they have health issues. And if we don't get them out, uh, they will die in prison. And so what we're saying is as we reckon with the consequences of police terror, mass incarceration, political prisoners, let's not limit it. Let's embrace all of the consequences. If you want to make even a measure of peace with the prisoners of the Black liberation struggle, let them go now. And, and I hope that we uh, take this call and use it to uh, uh, push for their release. Uh, I know in about a month and a half, there'll be the anniversary of the great hero, revolutionary hero, George Jackson, who was martyred uh, in a San Quentin court uh, in 1971. That was on August 21st. That's six weeks from now. And maybe in these coming six weeks, starting uh, with what we're going to do in July, where we always remember uh, Mumia. And, and this is the 25th anniversary of the attempt by the government to kill him. Uh, uh, plan some activities, petitions, but also mobilizations around freeing Mumia and all political prisoners that are still behind bars. And I should add, allowing Asada Shakur to come home and be free and see her family, her comrades, and her friends. Thank you. Thank you, Larry, for those remarks. Okay, our next speaker is so very, very special. Um, she is from the International Uncompromising Concerned Family and Friends of Mumia Abu-Jamal and Minister of Confrontation for the MOVE organization. I think most of us know who she is and is Pam Africa. We're so honored to have you, Pam. And could you tell us about the importance of July 4th for the movement and where Mamiya's case stands now? Okay. On the move, thank you. Um, where Mamiya case stands at right now um, is in our hands. We almost had Mumia home due to ju judicial and prosecutorial misconduct. We have been talking about this for years and all, but um, a few months ago, Judge Tucker, um, a black Republican judge, and all stated very clearly that Mumia needed, you know, that he should have an appeal. And when that was granted to him, um, some boxes was found. And in these boxes was evidence that was, was withheld and evidence of judicial and prosecutorial misconduct. And 
the um, DA here in Philadelphia, Krasner, he let 10 people go on judicial and prosecutorial misconduct, and that's a good thing. And uh, then he also let two people go from prison. They never came back to court due to judicial and prosecutorial misconduct. Mumia has everything that every last one of them had on their case and more, plus this worldwide movement who stands with the facts in Mumia's case. Um, But they came up with this thing called the King's Bench Law, and we'll get into that a little bit later. But that put a stay on Mumia's case. I want to point out that, again, Mumia could be home. We got to demand that they deal with the issue of judicial and prosecutorial misconduct. And uh, a trial, a hearing, hell no. And uh, release Mumia. He cannot get a fair trial in there. Nothing reason. In fact, Mumia never had a trial. He's been railroaded the whole time. But we got to demand in 2020, we brought home every MOVE member. And I'm saying long live the power of the people because this is what brought them home and the consistency of MOVE. We backed off the death penalty on Mumia. And uh, despite President and, you know, everything that they had that they could have, they came with. The beatings, the maiming, the jailing, and I will say it, the killing of people who supported Mumia. But we were able to pull him off of death row. At this point, we should be able to pull him, you know, I'm talking about in this year, 2020, based on the evidence that had come out by judges Also, we have the evidence we've been saying for the longest that they're trying to kill Mumia. In uh, in, um, Scranton, Mumia's case uh, was before him dealing with hepatitis C. And uh, the judge there discovered that the the prison and the officials there and the plan was to kill Mumia. It was exposed in the courtroom. And, um, you know, so I'm saying, you know, we cannot mess around. You know, because Mumia got to come from out here right now. July 4th is based on this. And you know, at the end of the railroad trial, the judge said to the jury on July 1st, he says, look, you can either go home, you know, or you be um, locked up over the weekend. And uh, if you want to go home, you have to come up with a decision. July 2nd, they came up with guilty. July 3rd, the death penalty. July 4th, they came up. You know, July 4th, they went home. July 4th, ever since this, 1982, we have never allowed a Welcome America, you know, um, demonstration of 4th of July to happen in the city without us protesting. And I say again, in this year, 2020, we have um, planned where they had the Rizzo statue at and uh, um, because it was pulled down. We'll talk about that later. And uh, But we're having a demonstration showing people that although they pulled that statue down, the mentality still exists. And uh, because Mumia's still in jail, a lot of political prisons, a lot of the maiming, the killing, you know, everything, and all still exists. And uh, so we're going to be at the Municipal Service Building where the Rizzo statue um, used to be at 12 o'clock. We're going to be joined by um, the group the group called Fist for the Fallen, reclaiming our independence in honor of our ancestors. They're coming in, they're starting at 30th and Market Street, and they're marching down to the demonstration that we're having. There's also another one, We Charge Genocide, that is starting at 6th and Market, and we're all coming in together, and all because we're talking about the genocide of not, of, of you know, of people. We're also talking about, you know, um, upholding the ancestors and all, and we're all coming together to deal with the issue of Mumia. And very simply, oh, for those people who don't know Mumia, tomorrow there's a webinar. It starts at 12 a.m. tonight, I mean 12 a.m. Thursday night, and goes all the way up to 12 a.m. Friday, um, starts, yeah, the third on Friday. And um, it's 24 hours. The Mumia Marathon starts July 3rd, goes over to July 4th, 2020, 12 a.m. to 12 a.m. 
um, and we're asking people to look at it because the marathon starts from the Rizzo days and it goes all the way up to time present. It goes into the millions for Mumia, you know, which, you know, I got to hand it to Monica, Larry, um, and Workers World, whose idea that was to have a millions for Mumia, and we did just that. And uh, Cuba and our uh, um, involvement, you know, in this, and uh, the uh, French government, Africa, and, uh, you know, um, Brazil, all the people that's been involved in it, and you'll see how through the years the battle has gone and uh, um, with um, – Youth and uh, it was a youthful movement then, and uh, and it's a youthful movement now. So the youth that's working today is a lot of the children that came up under us, and uh, you know that was um, that learned from the work that we have done and the steadfastness of staying in the street. And all I can say is my hat is off to them. I salute each and every last one of them who had the stamina to stand, you know, uh, you know, firmly against this government. And I think my seven minutes is up, so I'll be back for questions and answers. Um, thank everybody for, you know, being on this webinar. And please, July 4th and uh, wherever you at, and, uh, you know, raise up the issue of political prisoners, raise up the issue of what's happening with Mumia, because in 2020, we can bring them home. You know, we are ready to knock this system down on its knees. All we got to do is take our foot and kick it, um, kick it in the face and knock it the rest of the way over. And uh, long live revolution, long live the people who have helped pull things to the point where it is today, down with this rotten ass system. Thank you, Pam. Free Mamiya, free them all. Free Mamiya, free them all. <laughs> Thank you. Before I introduce our next speaker, I would like to remind everyone to put your questions in the Q&A so that we can have a rich discussion. We will try to get to as many questions as we can after our last speaker. Next. We're going to hear from Mamiya Abu-Jamal himself. This video was recorded earlier today via Zoom by Ted Kelly, a co-editor of the Tear Down the Walls prison page of WW. Mamiya spoke from the visiting room of SCI Mahanoy in central Pennsylvania. So we'll now hear from Comrade Mamiya. In Pennsylvania, anyway. By virtue of statutory law and custom, he can call for an arbitrator, right? right? The arbitrator invariably gets not just a pocket, but like a, a bag full of money. Yeah. He prevails. And once his judgment is entered, not even the government can touch it. It's locked into law. At one level. It's locked into law. And therefore, that gives them that sense of truth. If this is not a theoretical argument, if you look at that cop show. Now, um, you know, history has its tongue of irony with us at all times. This guy's name is Chauvin, right? <laughs> I, is that right? Right? Right. Huh? Chauvinistic? He's Can literally he a chauvinist, right? yeah. Literally. But yeah. look at this cat's mug. And that's in general. Yeah, yeah. You look at him with his name. He's like, got his hands in his pockets like, yeah. Yep. So what? Yep. And guess what? He may have won. Yep. Don't get it done. This is still okay. And so, you know, unless we're talking about in destroying that impunity, then nothing will be reformed. Yeah. I remember Ferguson when Obama and his week was talking about body uh, cameras. Body cameras. Yeah. Now that will solve all his problems. You know, look at Chauvin. 
It's bullshit. It's bullshit. This is complete bullshit. The there have been victories. These like concessions are still hard won victories, even though they're distractions. But that what would what would break the FOP's dictatorship more than say freeing political prisoners like yourself, you know? Like especially your like in your case, like they have it has been their main thing to to keep you That's true. inside, you know. That's true. They've expended enormous resources to do it. Yeah. But what would take more than that? Mm -hmm. The repeal of Act One Eleven. Act One Eleven. Yes. 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 That is the jewel of the ground. Yeah. Right. It really is. Because that's their tool of impunity. Yes. But repeal Act One Eleven. And they're going to break under their weight. They will break under their weight. Yeah. You know, like, me getting out is like a cherry on top. You feel like 111, their cherry's busted. So, <laughs> it, it would be a big fucking cherry, though, Mumia. <laughs> yeah, it would be. It would be. <laughs> Thank you, Mamiya, and thank you, Ted, for conducting this important interview with Mamiya. Uh, now I would like to introduce Comrade Maya X from Boston for a spoken world word performance for this evening's program. Maya, <coughs> she, her, is a Workers' World Party member, revolutionary student, cultural archivist, warrior poet, Marxist comrade and ally. Welcome, Maya. Greetings, comrades and community. Can you all hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, I'm going to share a brief piece that's still going to be a work in progress that the whole entire piece will be revealed for Black August. Um, so I begin with solidarity with all the resistance fighters on the battlefield, especially throughout this next 48 hours when imperialism thinks they wanna celebrate with fireworks on the 4th of day lies. 
Sankofa, meaning return and get it. The, ket the Keted drum is awakened tonight. The symbol of Sankofa adorns my right middle finger, feeling in the atmosphere. Spent some time politicking with the spirits. Body locked behind bars, yet spirit remains free. Gratitude for the reminder. Comandante Ho Chi Minh. Feeling in the atmosphere as the fervor is rising. Say his name, Shaka Sankofa. Say his name, Shaka Sankofa. Rewind, June 22nd, 2000. Let me drop some numbers. 648 since 76. 222 in Texas. 484 by lethal injection. 135 by G.W. Bush. Keta drum awakens tonight. Ancestral essence haunts Crawford, Texas. 20 years to the date, Sankofa still rising. Keep marching, Black people. Tonight they killed me. Keep marching, Black people. As I look to the left, Herman Bell, Chairman Fred, and George Jackson. Turn to the right, Winnie Mandela next to Rochelle McGee. Comrade Monica building with Asada Shakur. Che chanting up Babylon all around. Words as electric feels. Bambara, never forget Shaka Sankofa. Your final words reverberates and travels across generations. They are killing me tonight. They are murdering me tonight. But we are the seeds that have been planted and we are the seeds that will advance because never, ever, ever Will we let them stop until we free them all from the blocks to the wall? The struggle continues. Thank you. Black August for the rest, y'all. Thank you so much, Maya. We can't wait to hear the rest of it for Black August. Um, before I introduce the next speaker, I would like to play a short video clip from the campaign for retrial of Imam Jamil. All right. Yes, sir. October 13th, 1997 to December 22nd of 2000. Yes, sir. All right. Isn't it true that during that incarceration, you contacted uh, the Federal Bureau of Investigation and told them that you had committed a murder and were involved in the shooting of a cop in March of 2000 in Atlanta, Georgia. Yes. You did? Yes. All right. And you couldn't have because you were in prison in Nevada, right? No, sir. I got out of prison in 2000 in February. I was on house arrest when the murder took place. You might want to check that out. I was on house arrest. I was staying at 2380 Jernigan's Street, Southwest Atlanta. You just said that you were incarcerated in Las Vegas in 1997 through December of 2000. I went back to prison after that shooting. I was violated and sent back to prison after the police shooting. That's why it says BP by my name. That's parole violation. If you look at the photo, it says BP beside my number. That means parole violation. You violated your probation because you went back to prison. Exactly. I violated after the shooting. You were interviewed by the Federal Bureau of Investigations for that out there at Nevada prison, were you not in July? Yes, sir. Of that year? Yes, sir. And he ruled you out and said you did not commit that murder in Las Vegas, correct? Um, I don't know. What I mean, that, that murder in Atlanta. I have no idea what his conclusion was, sir. All right. You weren't arrested for it, were you? No, sir. I was not. In fact, another person was tried and convicted. Jamil Alameen, yes, sir. Yes, sir. And once again, it seems to me like you were getting a lot of I was shot proof. that day. I'm sorry? I was shot um, March of 2000. It happened March 17th of 2000. 
Your Honor, we can take a break right now. Come back. Okay. We'll take 10 minutes. Okay, uh, now I would like to introduce Shafia Imbalia, Southern Regional Co Coordinator for the Imam Jamil Action Network. Imam Jamil was formerly known as H. Rap Brown. Shafia, Shafia is also a member of Black Workers for Justice and Muslims for Social Justice. Can you comment on the current legal situation with Jamil's case and why this important leader of the Black Power Movement of the 1960s can never be forgotten? Well, <clears throat> first of all, uh, let me just start by saying Bismillah. I ask Allah to guide my heart and guide my tongue. Assalamu alaikum, everyone, free to land on the move. My name is Shafi Mbali. I am the Southern Regional Coordinator for Imam Jamil Action Network. Formerly known, Imam Jamil is formerly known as H. Rat Brown. I want to thank Workers World for inviting IJAN to highlight the latest update in Imam Jamil's case. Uh, because we have such a tight time, I, I wrote these, these comments out and so that I can stay within our time limit. I also want on behalf of IJAN to give shout outs of solidarity to Brother Mumia and all the other political prisoners and prisoners at war. Free Imam Jamil, free Mumia Abu Jamal, free them all. I never want to start talking about this case from the angle of the state, but with the shortness of time tonight, it's absolutely critical for you to have heard the voice of the person who has repeatedly confessed for 20 years to what Imam Jamil was convicted for. Five minutes is not enough to present the history, the importance, the legacy, or the case of Imam Jamil Abdullah Alamin, formerly known as H. Rab Brown. But it is enough time to focus your attention on the action of signing the petition for retrial for Imam Jamil at whathappentorap.com. In January, this past January, at the inaugural hearing of the Fulton County, Georgia Conviction Integrity Unit, organized to hear past cases uh, where that office had made mistakes of injustice. Former Ambassador Andrew Young called on the unit to review the case of Imam Jamil. He said it was heavy on his heart because Imam Jamil had been wrongfully convicted. The, com the petition campaign was started for a retrial immediately. And when 10,000 signatures were reached, Kyrie Alamin, Imam Jamil's son, an attorney and other attorneys filed formally uh, for the retrial. The, the case is being reviewed now by this unit. We must keep the pressure up. It is only, and I think Brother Larry raised this earlier, it is only from the pressure of the people that these institutions will, will respond. We must keep the pressure up on Fulton County DA Paul Howard, showing him that the support of the people is held by Imam Jamil. We have more than 47,000 signatures as of this morning. We want 100,000 because every signature goes to DA's office and adds to the pressure. The US empire is terrified by the threat of black insurrection. And it is the work that's being done in the streets now that is putting pressure on all of the Paul Howards and this Paul Howard to charge the killers of Rashad Brooks. It is that work in the streets and your focused work on this petition now at whathappentorap.com that will win a new trial for Imam Jamil. Now in this time of uprising and people where people are demanding the defunding and demilitarizing of the police, community control of the police, when people and governments around the world are speaking and marching in solidarity with black lives in the United States, we remind ourselves that Imam Jamil was, was one who worked at building unity and solidarity from neighborhood streets 
to the national level, to internationally, both before and after he became Muslim. Now, while we fight voter suppression and attempted intimidation, Imam Jamil had the character, courage, and leadership to physically defend Black people to vote and to form independent political organizations to address the needs of the people. He upheld the right of our people to, to defend ourselves. Now in this pandemic, Imam Jamil showed character, courage, and leadership when the crack epidemic was raging through our communities to clean up the neighborhoods. You didn't see 11-year-old girls laying themselves across car windshields at the stoplight selling their bodies for a hit in the West End. Now, as the police make money off our young people in street organizations, so-called gangs, Imam Jamil showed character, courage, and leadership to bring them together in summits across the country to see their purpose in building peace, building security of our community, and building community. That work continues today. For those newly joining the people in the streets, the young ones bringing uh, their bodies into struggle. Some of the ones who've been out here already will tell you about Nelson Mandela, freedom fighter of South Africa, who withstood 27 years in prison for standing for power and truth. But Imam Jamil, Mumia Abu Jamal, Matulu Shakur, Jalil Mutakin, Michelle McGee, Sundiata Akoli, and many more are our Mandelas political prisoners and prisoners at war, withstanding 20, 40, 50 years and more in US gulags, US prisons for standing for justice and truth. And we know that struggle today in the streets is going to produce more Mandelas. Imam Jamil is a bridge between our Mandelas of the 60s, 70s, 80s, and on till today. We ask you to stand for his freedom to sign the petition for a retrial at whathappentorap.com. Share the petition for a retrial at whathappentorap.com. Free Imam Jamil, free Mumia Abu Jamal, free them all. And if there's anything that I've said that is inconsistent with what Allah has given us, all faults are mine. And if there's anything that I've said that has helped you to gain insight, then all praises are due to Allah. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you so much for your powerful words. Appreciate your time. Thank you. If you would like to receive daily updates for Workers World, it's really easy. You can subscribe at workers.org. We've been printing a weekly edition of our newspaper since WWP first began in 1959. We suspended our paper during the COVID pandemic for health and safety reasons. However, we plan to get the print edition up and running in the near future. Workers World provides free print subscriptions to anyone who is currently incarcerated, and you can support our prisoner subscription program at patreon.com slash WWP. Our final speaker is Abdul Halim Mohammed student minister, Nation of Islam here in Houston, Texas. Abdul Halim was the spiritual advisor to Shaka Sankofa, a political prisoner who was executed by the state of Texas 20 years ago, last week. Brother Mohammed, can you talk about the legacy of Shaka Sankofa in terms of the ongoing struggle for the abolition of these concentration camps called prison? Thank you, Sister Miranda. In the name of Allah, the beneficent and merciful, I bear This is Messenger. I greet you all. Assalamu alaikum. Free the land, on the move, and uh, we just can't stop till we get organized and we get free. Let me first of all bring you greetings from the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan and his National Prison Reform Minister, uh, Brother Abdullah Muhammad. And I want to thank Sister Gloria Rubeck of the Texas. Uh, uh, abolition, uh, death penalty abolition coalition for the invitation to be a part of this. June 22, 2000 was a date that I will never forget for a young man, 
uh, that was being executed right before our eyes. He was convicted at 17 years old. Uh, he was poor, he was undereducated. He was uh, from a broken family. He was convicted of capital murder, sentenced to death, had a uh, incompetent lawyer by the name of Ron Mock. It was a sham trial, questionable witnesses and questionable evidence. But that man grew into a student, a scholar, a soldier, a revolutionary, and a martyr. And his case galvanized a global movement against the racist anti-poor death penalty. We have a saying down here in Texas. In Texas, it's better to be rich and poor, I mean rich and guilty, than to be poor and innocent. Shaka was so profound in the words that he spoke on the gurney while the chemicals were pouring in his veins that you heard our sister repeat some of them in her spoken word piece because it does reverberate through the generations. But to show you how profound it was and impacted on us and the Nation of Islam and the Honorable Farrakhan, Minister Farrakhan replaced his article in the center of our newspaper, The Final Call, with Shaka's last statement in death row. He said, you can kill the revolutionary, but you can't kill the revolution. Now, when I was with Shaka last, and I, I'll try to tighten this all up uh, within my respective time period, we were together our last meeting together before his execution, before the Supreme Court decided that they would not stay his execution, we were in the whole in the holding cell having our conversation as his spiritual advisor. And he said to me, brother, the board of pardon and parole decision comes as no surprise. He said, Governor Bush missed an opportunity to exercise influence and leadership. And he said these words. Even a blind man is held accountable. He said that the opposition recognized the significance of this case and all the cases that we're discussing right now. That's why we need to free them all. This is why they fought so hard, he said. This case brought together leadership to create change. The law used to execute me, he said, is in conflict with, the, with biblical and Quranic law, not having four witnesses. He said, now listen to this. This is, this is what I mean, the spirit we have to embody. He said, death is a compliment to life. He said, they make it something to fear so that they can control us. But he said to me, non-cooperation with evil is an obligation. To be an effective leader, you must be willing to pay the price. To have his last meal there on the floor I said, brother, are you going to eat that? He said, no, brother. He said, to accept this last meal is to accept injustice. He, he, the spirit of this brother was such. Now, I want to close by simply saying this to you all. We cannot allow the current movement and uprising in the streets of America and globally around the world to be narrowly focused on just police reform, because you can't reform the police unless you reform global white supremacy and this uh, this aberration called capitalism. The police or the constabulary enforced the Fugitive Slave Act, the convict leasing system, the black codes, segregation of Jim Crow, the anti-woman suffrage movement, and, and what's ironic about the police union, the corporatocracy used to use the police union to do union busting. Isn't that something? They played a role in COINTELPRO. They sparked many of the urban rebellions of the 60s and 70s. It was a police raid that sparked the, the, re the rebellion in Detroit. It was a police, uh, police misconduct that sparked it in Watts and in Newark. It's even the spark that sparked the Stonewall uh, uprising uh, in New York. It was a police raid. So look. I want all of you to understand today that this movement 
We must pass on what we know to this younger generation. We must educate them to our Imam, Jamil al -Amin. We also let him know about his evolution from H. Rap Brown, what he said, violence is as American as cherry pie. We've got to let them know about Mumia Abu Jamal. He was already a brilliant journalist when they convicted him, but he has evolved into a human being that has universal appeal and has much value to passing on the struggle. And so I want to invite every member of the human family, regardless of creed, class, or color, sexual orientation, whatever your political ideology is, to hear the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan on July 4. Go to NOI.org. And uh, it's at 10 o'clock Central Time, 11 o'clock East Coast Time, and 8 o'clock Pacific Time. He has a message for the whole world in this hour. We listen to him, and then you decide what you want to do. But as for me, I want to get organized. I want to get free. I want to be like Pam Africa. I want to stay on the move. I want to free them all, all the political prisoners and even the prisoners of politics, which make up this prison industrial complex here in America. And let us not forget that this is a profit-making system. Our enemies are the media. Our enemies are the pollsters who feed these statistics to these politicians. Our enemy are these politicians who are bought out by the corporatocracy and dark money. And our enemy are the established interests who profit off of the bodies of our brothers and sisters and our comrades. I thank you for listening. I pray Allah blesses each and every one of you with the light of his understanding and the spirit to get up and fight. For the Holy Quran says these words, persecution is worse than slaughter, and we just can't take it no more. May Allah bless you as I greet you in peace. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you so much, Brother Muhammad. Um, this webinar was organized by the newly reformed Prisoner Solidarity Committee of Workers' Well Party. I would now like to ask all of the panelists and my co-moderator to turn on their video so that you can all participate in this discussion. So I just wanna make sure that happens. Okay. Um, thanks, Abdul. I'm still waiting for, okay, Larry, Shafia. Maya, oh, I was say Maya doesn't have, okay, great. Okay, great. And I think uh, hopefully Pam is still on the phone. Are you still there, Pam? Yes, okay. I am. Oh, great. Okay. All right. So we have these questions. Hold on. Let me find the first one. Um, let's see. First of all, okay, this is this is a good one. <laughs> well, all of them are great. Um, what did Mamiya do to make the FOP hate him so much? That's one question. Anybody <laughs> want to ex expound on that? Some of it was already raised before, but anybody else want to say more? I can jump in a little bit. I'm sure Pam will add to it. Uh, Mumia was and is dedicated from, from his youth to, to be the voice of the voiceless, to take the stories of the people and show their connection and how they, uh, their connection in, in the chain of oppression. He was a member of the Black Panther Party, which was hated by the police and targeted by the police. And so when you had a combination of someone who is dedicated, who is principled, who is talented, who is fearless, uh, who is consistent, and that that is why that combination of traits uh, and his willingness to carry it out um, made him hated by the Philadelphia Police Department 
as well as you know any all of the other so-called law enforcement in the city of Philadelphia. I think that that would be a beginning. He was articulate and always was articulate. And he was able to use all types of media. Um, he did radio, he did journalism, he did uh, written journalism, he did all of that. And he was he he also um, in the first attack or move in 19, Pam will correct me, I think it was 76. Um, he was the one who exposed the fact that the police who got shot was shot in the back. So it had to have been from friendly fire. Um, and so, you know, it, it was, it's, it was, it's about retribution. It's about retribution. Okay. Thank you. Um, I think if Pam can one thing. Yeah, you know, Pam, before yes. you do before you do that, I wanted to raise this question with you. So you maybe you could do both at the same time. What are the oh, well, I'm happy. what are the dangers let, of let, what are the dangers of this case being handed over to Josh Shapiro? Why is this happening? Along with other things you want to say about Mumia. All right, the case is being handed over to John Shapiro simply behind the fact that we won it. We won the case. John Shapiro was one of them people that would do anything. He's like the Trump followers and, or, you know, whatever he can do to appease these people. But one thing for sure, and uh, it's being exposed. And this is one of the reasons why this government wants to take Momia out because of the exposure that he gives to, you know, all the problems that's happening. And uh, his voice, you know, a God-given voice, a mama-given voice, a um, um, voice, you know, this voice and all that can carry the truth and to the point that people can hear it. It's like Malcolm, you know, and all the other people before him, but he's able to tell the truth and explain them like no one else and an example of why they hate him this webinar tonight and all because we are able to bring his voice I know that you couldn't hear I know I couldn't hear really good what it was that he was saying and uh but I know my ear was tuned to it these people hate that they hate that and uh, because exposure means you know wiping them out Larry, That's did you why want to they hate. Okay, thank you, Pam. Larry, did you want to say something? Uh, yeah, just to echo what my other comrades are saying, uh, Mumia is a professional journalist. And what I mean by that, you know, he is uh, a student of history, uh, both the history of the world, the history of everything, but most importantly, the history of oppressed people in the struggle. And uh, he honed his craft as a journalist uh, and was very, very effective. Uh, every uh, important voice uh, has things that distinguish them, Martin Luther King, uh, Malcolm X. And so comparing them is like comparing apples and oranges. But Mumia's ability to reach people uh, was in the same league as a, as a Malcolm X. Uh, Mumia was, is brilliant and uh, uh, to know that is to have no doubt whatsoever that he would be considered, even going back to the days when Rizzo, before he became mayor, was the police commissioner in Philly, uh, spotted and targeted and labeled as a dangerous person. And you knew that sooner or later, they would find a way to frame him up and kill him. That was their hope. Uh, and uh, they couldn't do that. So they had to settle 
for keeping him behind bars for the rest of his of, of his life. And, and 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 just to go back to not only the point I made, but what other people have made so strongly uh, for for all of the people who are marching for Black Lives Matter, you know, all who are, you know, angered and outraged by the lynching of George Floyd and all of the others, and all who see this as finally, you know, the revolution, the beginning of the revolution, you know, we're tearing down statues, uh, we're, we're defunding the police, we're pushing them back, we want to take their power away from them. You can't do that unless you take some of that energy, some of that new power that you have, and channel that toward freeing Mumia and these other political prisoners, because they are casualties of the police war against the Black liberation movement. And we need to try to do everything that we can in 2020 to make that reckoning become a reality and end up in greeting Mumia as he walks out of the dungeon. Thank you very much, Larry. Um, next question I have is, what are some of the health concerns of the political prisoners who are all elders right now? In particular, how is Imam Jamil? Are there any ongoing campaigns for the release based on these health concerns? You want to speak, you'll have to unmute yourself. Oh, you're um, good. I'm muted. Okay. Um, well, to quote um, Brother Kyrie, uh, Imam Jamil has been struggling against smoldering myeloma, which is an early form of cancer. Um, he had a stroke, a mild stroke last summer. Um, but currently, he is dealing with uh, cataracts. And so he has to have assistance in, in writing. Um, he's supposedly on the list, but you know, we and other political prison campaigns have coined the term execution by medical neglect. It has been clear that it is a strategy of the state to withhold, not only um, keep these brothers and sisters incarcerated, but to deny and withhold and delay medical care. Brother Matulu Shakur has bone cancer. Brother Jalil Muntakin just got over COVID-19. He was scheduled to be released. Um, there was a uh, uh, there was a, I believe it was a court order that was calling him on him to be released because uh, to, in order not to, to, to contract COVID-19, um, his release was opposed. He, he got, he, he, he acquired COVID-19. He was in, in the hospital. Uh, and fortunately we've received word that he is, he did, he did overcome it and he's out. Um, we've all heard about the conditions that Mumia has been fighting. Um, there was a case of Robert Seth Hayes while he was in. So th this is a, a, a strategy that the state has been using and using against other move members um, and making folks go to court for treatment. And even when a judge, uh, th and this, this, this speaks to the limitations of the court system. You know, when folks talk about what they got to do, even when a judge has ordered treatment for Mumia or treatment for other political prisoners, and you have the Department of Corrections and whether, whether it's federal or whether it's state refusing to follow the orders of, 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 a, of a judge, that says that, you know, there's the determination that uh, a, a fundamental fear and determination to not to destroy this connection 
that these that these brothers and sisters have with folks outside and to break their spirit. And I do want to say that a number of these brothers and sisters, they, they're not just simply languishing and, 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 and hoping that someone gets them out. They are functioning, they are active. Um, Brother Jaleel Muntakin is put, making proposals in terms of an international tribunal, um, asking the United Nations to come in and to, uh, um, to bring in jurors to tour the prisons, um, particularly political prisoners. Um, Brother Mutulu Shakur, has um, put together a truth and reconciliation campaign. Um, so they are very active in thinking and making all kinds of proposals and, and wanting to stay connected to, you know, the, the liberation movement on the outside of the walls. You know, they have history, they have wisdom, you know, they are casualties, but they're still fighters, they're still warriors, you know, and they may be down, they may be contained, but they are still, and in fact, um, many of them have been specifically told that, uh, I believe it was Sundiata, uh, was told specifically that he's being held because he refuses to break. He refuses to bow down. Um, and so this is, the, this is the, the strength of all of them. And this is the importance of freeing them, you know, uh, the United States Army, if we want to use a, you know, use them, you know, they have a, they have a, and, and most other armies, they have a, a, a code. You don't leave anybody on the battlefield. You don't leave anybody on the battlefield. We can learn from them. We can, we can learn from that wisdom. We need to pass that on to the current fighters who are out there now and have them understand the nature of the state the nature of the prison system, the nature of capitalism. They can teach all of those lessons, the, the incarceration of these brothers and sisters and the fight to free them, the fight for medical care, the fight for every inch of their condition is an education for those of us who are out, out here on the streets. Thank you so much for that. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and ask one more question. Um, when we when we say political prisoner, how do we how do y'all define how do y'all define political prisoners? May may I uh, take a stab at that? You may go ahead. In my statement, I I made kind of two statements. My grandson wants to he's getting educated right here, brother Larry. He's getting educated, <laughs> and he just wanted to, he wanted to give everyone the greetings, but. I, I use two terms. I said political prisoners and prisoners of politics, okay? Political prisoners, of course, would be those who are in prison where they use the prison industrial complex and the police and law enforcement and the courts against people whose politics or philosophy or ideology is against the status quo, okay? They're locked up. For, for, for reasons that they're so ridiculous in some cases, and why won't they let them go even when their own court system says let them go? And then they are prisoners of politics. And what we have to understand is, is that I'll take you back to the 60s. We talk about the great society. And oftentimes, even as activists, and, and we, we make the mistake of putting everything on Richard Nixon. But I, I, want, I want to bring to your attention, studying the great society, there was a twofold, there was the war on poverty, and then there was the war on crime. Because Lyndon Johnson, remember the Watch Riots took place in 1965. Before the Watch Riot, he had impaneled a crime commission. And then after the Watch Riot, he passed a crime law. And when Richard Nixon came in office, what he did was he dropped the war on poverty, but he kept the war on crime. And we've had a war on drugs. We had a war on terror. We had a war on gangs. And we don't, we should be, uh, why are we surprised that there's the militarization of the police force? They're getting military equipment because they're at war with the very citizens. And we see the wealth inequity. And so we must not, we must not be duped into believing that changing out one light bulb 
a, 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 a red light bulb for a blue light bulb is going to give us any better light in the White House. Let, let me be clear. Our oppression is bipartisan. It doesn't matter whether it's it's uh, Satan or the devil in there. We catch hell with whomever's in the office because their job is to protect the corporatocracy. If Hollywood will make it per will make it popular, and and Wall Street will finance it, and Main Street will be sucker enough to buy it, then you and I will be having these webinars until the cows come home because there will always be political prisoners. Some of these young people are out here fighting now are gonna become political prisoners because they're targeted right now. And after 9-11, we're living in a post 9-11 world with the Patriot Act and even the, the Democrats renewed it. So everything that we're saying, everything that we do, everything that we text, everything that we email, everything that we say over these airwaves right now is going into a big database and, and we are targeted. So I don't mind uh, being a political prisoner there's only two things to worry about. Either we're going to jail or we're not. If we're not, ain't nothing to worry about. If we do, if I do go to jail, the brothers will be so happy to see me when I get in there, ain't nothing to worry about. So let's get them on free to land and keep up the big fight. I just wanted to come, come. Oh, this just, is Maya. If I could say something, I okay. Comrade Monica. No, I just, I'm going to be very brief. Um, it goes back to the issue of what's going on today with this rebellion, this uprising against police brutality, against white supremacy, and ultimately it's gonna to lead to a struggle really to get rid of capitalism. But while we're in this particular stage of this uprising, and we're having this very important uh, discussion tonight about you know, political prisoners, you know, and freeing them all. I, I think it would help in terms of raising their, um, not status, but raising awareness about who these political prisoners are. When there's a demonstration, there's nothing wrong with, if, 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 some, if there's a demonstration um, against the police or to bring the statues down, these, these, these pro-slavery white supremacists uh, statues. How about bringing a sign that says free Mamiya, abolish the police, or free Leonard Peltier, abolish the police. In other words, making that connection. So if people are looking at these signs and they're going to ask, well, who is Mamiya? Who is Leonard Peltier? You know, it will start a conversation about, you know, who these prisoners of war are and what they have been fighting for in and out of prison to make that connection in terms of the role that prisons are playing today besides incarcerating you know, our youth and inc inc incarcerating workers you know, who can't find jobs or black and brown you know, uh, young people who can't find jobs. Um, so it's a question of how do we bring awareness in terms of who are these political prisoners from Jalil, you know, from Alamine to, you know, Jalil uh, Monticum, um, Dr. Matula Shakur, uh, Sundiata Akoli, all of them. I mean, there's really hundreds of political prisoners, but these are the most prominent. So we should think of ways of bringing awareness through placards, through uh, literature, whenever we can. So I just wanted to, to raise that as an idea. So Maya, you're next. Yeah, I'm sorry. Thank you, comrades. Um, I just wanted to share a brief excerpt from George Jackson, um, Blood in My Eye, in reference to um, you know, what the comrades have just said, as well as um, the question. So in this brief excerpt, um, comrade George Jackson says, my enemies are institutions and any men with vested interest in them even if that interest is only a wage. If revolution means civil war, I accept. And the sooner begun, the sooner done. I don't think the enemy can be identified any more carefully than this. Further identification must be made in the process. 
I feel elated that my brother died with two guns in his hands. I'm going to miss him and all the others. Though death in our, in, though death in our situation is only a release. I miss people intensely. I miss him intensely, but he and the others who sought freedom died at the throat of the principal repressive institution of the empire. They died making real attempts at freedom. I paraphrase Comodante Castro on trial after Moncada. I warn you, gentlemen, I have only begun. Thank you. Thank you so Can I much. chime in on that if there's a second? Yeah, go ahead. Larry, wait, Larry, wait a minute. We, we, we're going to be asking everyone to give final comments. So you can make that as, you know, just. Oh, okay, I'll do that. I'll do that. Mm -hmm. So, Marina, do you want to go ahead and. Yeah. Um, uh, we'll go ahead and just take final comments for, from folks. We're getting ready to wrap up. Larry, did you want to go first? Um, sure, thank you. Uh, I, I think just as more and more people are realizing that the police do not exist to protect people, but rather to uh, keep them down and keep them in their place in the interests of defending capitalism, uh, more and more people are also realizing that uh, the way that the system is dealing with black and brown people who are poor is to warehouse them in prisons. And so uh, in that context, it's a political process. It's a deliberate systemic process and they're political prisoners. It's the difference between uh, being a conscious political prisoner, but a lot of prisoners who didn't realize that they were political, uh, you'd be surprised uh, how quick they get it. Um, but I think as we move forward, and as more and more people are understanding the reasons behind the lies that are put forth to defend the police, the, the, the prisons, uh, uh, that the whole struggle is moving in one direction, a very important direction, and that is the abolition of capitalism, the abolition of class society, the abolition of exploitation uh, of the workers and the poor by a shrinking handful of rich people. Uh, that will take time on one hand, but uprisings such as the one that we witnessed recently, they tell us that that revolution, that reckoning is sooner than we think. And then you add all that's happening with the economy, with unemployment, the way that the pandemic uh, is impacting society, particularly not exclusively black and brown people. And so it's just, you know, sometimes things go on for a long time and they don't change and you don't see the light at the end of the tunnel, that light being the possibility of revolutionary transformation. Uh, well, the light has just come on and revolutionary transformation is no longer so far off beyond the horizon that you can't see it. We can see it. So uh, our job as revolutionaries will be moving forward to, to come together more and more with the same purpose, fight and fight and fight, but bring us closer to the revolutionary transformation. Thank you very much, Larry. Uh, Pam, did you want to make any final comments? Might have to I had to, um, did you hear me? Because I had to unmute my phone as well, did I? 
Yeah, I can hear you now. Okay. Um, I agree with people on the issue of, you know, what a political prisoner, you know, is. Um, I, but I just want to add this. And uh, two people uh, are good examples on why Mamiya should be home. One is a brother by the name of Bilal Wilson. The other one is a brother by the name of Willie Vise. These were the two brothers that was released from prison when they said, you know, they was releasing them on judicial and prosecutorial misconduct. They never came into Philadelphia to go to court to be released, but based on the evidence, we have that and we have more. That's why at this point we are actually demanding with actual backup. Although we had it before, never before did we have a judge say that, you know, Mumia deserved an appeal based on, you know, the judicial and prosecutorial misconduct. Um, never before did we have a judge stand up and say that, you know, they're trying to kill Mumia, and, uh, and he stopped them again. And uh, so what I'm saying is that we're not without the power to bring Mumia home and bring him home now. He almost died three times on us. And, uh, you know, so at this point, we need to bring him home. And I want to talk about, you know, want to bring up the name of Russell Maroon Schultz, and, uh, who is also and, uh, um, fighting for his life. I mean, really fighting for his life every day. And uh, he also was given cancer inside the prison. And uh, we got to fight and keep bringing our political prisoners' names up. And I want to say um, Brother Ghani from Philadelphia, and uh, who went in as a young teenager, and it's another brother by the name of Celine who went in as a young teenager and spent over 40 years in prison and came out, and they said when they went in, they had the thug-like mentality, and, uh, you know, both of them had went in for murders in which, you know, they're doing the work to take, you know, to remove that stigma from them. Um, they tell you who mentored them, who turned them into front-line revolutionaries who did 40-something years in jail and wanted to give back. Matula Shakur, Sundi Ada Okoli, the, um, the move men in the different prisons, the, um, and Mumia Abu-Jamal, and brothers' names that people don't even know who mentored these brothers. We have some these youth that is coming out here now and coming to these front lines and uh, with the education to do the work. And, uh, you know, we again have to applaud political prisoners that's inside them prisons and uh, they're in there like Moves said, you know, we're in here to bring out information and to also teach while we're there. And I'm saying the jobs that they are doing is... You know, I mean, if, if I ever, if a son of mine ever went to jail, I would want to have someone like them, you know, there to uh, mentor them and bring them out. Again, people, please, July 4th, come out and, uh, you know, or speak out wherever you're at and uh, about what's happening, you know, with Mumia. And the reason why I say Mumia and others is because this is the day that they took the party after they did what they did to Mumia. We must never let them forget what they did, and we can bring Mumia home. Thank you so much, Pam, and thank you to all of our speakers. I really appreciate it listening to everybody answer some of these questions. I hope that everyone's enjoyed tonight's webinar. Uh, Workers' World Party needs your support to continue the revolutionary struggle in this country. We are in the streets every day. We're doing jail support, helping with mutual aid programs, and showing solidarity. We're a totally volunteer organization, and we depend upon donations from people like you for our survival. Everything under capitalism takes money, and any amount that you can donate will help. We will put it all into continuing the struggle to bring down this rotten, racist, oppressive system. You can donate in three ways. Venmo at Workers World, workers.org slash donate, or patreon.com slash WWP. All donations to Patreon.com will go directly to providing free subscriptions of Workers' World newspaper to prisoners all over the country. This is an important part of our solidarity with people behind the bars and walls of U.S. prisons, jails, and detention centers. Our newly formed, reformed Prisoner Solidarity Committee says it loudly and clearly, free them all.
Thanks, everybody. Thanks to the wonderful panel. Thanks, everybody. Thank, thank you for the invitation. Thank you. So, thank you for you. accepting. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you all. It was good to continue. What's yes. the call? Free them all. What's the call? Free them all. 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 Free them all.